So starting from our previous video, or rather continuing from it, uh, let's have a look at how we can start messing around with some of the new buoyancy settings. Now, turning on buoyancy for the object that we've already made with our uh, special class isn't too difficult. We can uh, select it, uh, the normal one component, and enable simulate physics, and let's just simulate and see what happens. Good. And when we exit out, though, we've actually gotten a bunch of errors. So it's basically telling us that we need to change our collision response to include the physics. Like in the previous video where we showed, uh, this sort of thing isn't too important if we are just using the, simu uh, the water simulation, but we, if we want to use buoyancy, that is a physics calculation. So we need to enable to query and physics. So let's do that now, compile. And now when we hit play and exit, we're not getting this error anymore. But something you may have noticed is that our ball isn't moving. It's, uh, I mean, it's not moving with the ocean water. That is because we haven't enabled our ocean buoyancy. So this has gone through quite a bit of rework for this release, and these are the settings here. Now these match the Unreal Engine default buoyancy system a lot more, but there are a couple of differences and we'll be going over them uh, in a bit. So the quickest way to starting with to getting our ocean is enable use ocean buoyancy. If we enable that and hit play, we can see that our ball is now moving with the water. Now it is being dragged around a bit too much from the wave, so something that we could do is ocean wave drag, lower this to something like one. And we're getting a much more realistic sort of motion. Now, there are a couple of big differences and we'll be going them over right now. First of all, uh, these are a couple of settings near the top called buoyancy range, buoyancy depth and dead zone range. We'll be going over these three in a little bit later as well as the advanced tag. These are sort of an, an extra optimization step that's uh, purely optional. But if you have a really big level with lots of floating actors, this is something that you may want to explore. Next up, we have pretty much the standard Unreal Engine um, parameters, which are the buoyancy offset, dampening factor, max forcing coefficient, and so on and so forth. Now, there are two ways to apply these. Now, if we have something very simple like an actor here, the actor will pick up, uh, basically the actor will have uh, these parameters applied to it. Whoops, let's just hide everything here. We'll have these settings. However, on top of that, what we can do is actually open up our blueprint and add a BP buoyancy data. And that is an extra component. And once we hit compile, we can select our new component here and we can set this on a per actor basis. So for something very specific, like a ship can have different buoyancy offset factor or water coefficient and so forth. And the little C is just for custom buoyancy and so on. But if it's something really small like a debris or something that you don't want to mess with this, just remove this component and it's going to be using uh, these settings over here. Next up, we have a couple of optimization settings that says uh, use drag functions. So for ocean, so for water drag and ocean drag, uh, if you don't need these, you can disable them. This will save some calculations. Use dynamic dampening is something on our end. It's a little bit experimental and we don't really recommend using it at the moment. Uh, it's much better to use the custom component here if you want to have a sort of a unique behavior with the water. Something else we found out is that if you have, if you want to simulate something heavier, a really quick way to do this, and this isn't entirely physically possible, but it does a really good job to it. Oh, is to adjust the linear dampening and angular dampening. And now if we set these to one, you can see that our ball moves a bit less. Let's actually increase these a bit more, something like five. There we go. It's not just uh, floating around as uh, intensely as it did before. Does this have? No. Perfect. Next, another thing to keep track of is this mass setting because we're also using because we are using physics. This is important. So sometimes uh, you can 
when scaling an object, this value will also change. So that's something to keep track of. Right now it's still doing a pretty good job, so yeah. Next up, you have the use ocean buoyancy setting, and um, that will that will basically translate the simulated ocean surface into our physics calculations. We have the ocean buoyancy resolution. We have managed to increase this drastically since our last update. We can now go with values as high as 50, but we generally don't see a difference in quality past 36, but it's something you can play around with. In our previous version, the default value was five and um, it was running pretty slow at the same time. It wasn't really giving us um, a great sort of a uh, thing. Next up, you have ocean buoyancy preview and this will allow you to preview the grid that's uh, being created here, the resolution. And use tags buoyancy is that if we set this up, only objects with this tag that you can now set here will float. Everything else will not float. And next we also have the boat tag and we're gonna talk a bit more uh, about this a bit later. So right now what it do, let's have a quick preview of the material. So now because we have the use tags buoyancy, uh, our boat sank, but if we go here and go with the Oops. So as a little bit of a debug step, if we have our ocean buoyancy preview and we go into play, we can now go into wireframe mode and we could see this secondary grid that's now visible. And this is basically a sort of lower resolution ocean that is being used to uh, calculate the surface. Next up, something that you may have caught a glimpse of our previous video, if we scroll down, we have a new exposed set of parameters called water buoyancy channels. And this basically tells us, next up, if we scroll all the way down, this is something you may have seen in our previous video, but we now have water buoyancy channels. Uh, we have the same thing for simulation channels, and basically you can specify which object channel should um, interact with the buoyancy or the simulation system. Now we also have spaces for three custom channels if you want to separate these uh, objects into your own sort of categories. This will technically be the most uh, time consuming thing to set up. It's not really very time consuming but compared to like using these it's it'll take like a couple of extra minutes but you can have custom channels and in this project we have the custom waterline channel and it just shows up here. So to show you how it works quickly Right now we have our object here and this is using the world dynamic object type and we have our uh, world dynamic collision set to overlap. So now when we press play, we have the object interacting with the simulation, which is also set to overlap world dynamic. And if we set it to ignore, it falls through, but still creates simulation. And we can set this one to ignore as well. And now the object will not interact with waterline at all. Now this isn't on a per object basis. This is sort of for objects split into these groups. So let's just set these back to the way they were. And yeah, this is a new powerful tool for larger projects with, which, with lots of assets. And realistically, this is something that you should play around with a lot more. The important part is to have an object here that is set to uh, custom. Make sure the object type is either world static, world dynamic, whatever you want. But if it's supposed to interact with waterline, it needs to have this box set to overlap. But yeah, keep um, sort of manage how many of these objects will overlap with waterline as having one too many can um, increase or rather lower performance. So now let's have a look at some of the optimization settings that we talked about at the very beginning here. One is called buoyancy range, one is called buoyancy depth, and we have the dead zone range. So what these do, buoyancy range basically tells us uh, if an object has this specific tag, float two, past a certain point it's a uh, physics simulation will be stopped if it touches the if it's touching the water 
and it will basically go to sleep. So this is pretty good for uh, large sort of debris fields. Not really great for vehicles or more complex solutions. Uh, this isn't meant to be used for that. So now just to test it really quickly, I'm gonna go into the world settings and change the game override mode to our game mode base. This basically gives us a free camera and we're gonna tell Waterline to once again track our player character. So single player. And now to make things a bit clearer, let's change the buoyancy range to something like 100 or maybe even 50. So this is pretty much what range from the camera, the buoyancy will stop working. And now if we hit play, our object is sinking. It's not being picked up by the system. And the reason is that we didn't give it this tag. Uh, right here. Now, in this latest version, you can set these tags to whatever is comfortable to you. Right now, we have a float to tag. So let's select this, uh, go to our components, type in tag and set it to float to. And once we enable this, and we move away, you could see that this particular sphere has stopped moving, it's no longer buoyant, it's no longer interacting with the ocean. If we get close to it though, it's back in the simulation. Now you can treat these uh, simulation ranges as harshly as you want. So don't worry too much about it. This is basically for if you have a lot of objects, it's again, kind of an optional optimization step. Setting the buoyancy range to a thousand is pretty good. You could have something even larger. The only thing is just be mindful of ships and vehicles as this will require a little bit more tweaking or just increasing it outright a bit more. We are still working a little bit more on that end. Next up is the buoyancy depth and that basically tells you underwater how far down uh, an object will be picked up by the buoyancy system. So if we increase it, objects further down will start floating back up. And if not past this point, they will continue to sink. This is again an optimization step for really large projects. The dead zone range basically extends a couple of additional volumes right up to the horizon and anything that touches these um, grids will be frozen. Uh, the value of this, you can set it to something pretty high. Um, the higher it is, the better really. And yeah, basically making it really big is the right way to go. So what does that mean for more complex objects? Well. For starters, for something like a boat, we have our pretty much our old setup system where we have the boat model and floats one, two, three, and four. These are kind of hidden. We have the water surface mask, which is a secondary mesh. That's the inside of the mask, which has the water hull material. So waves don't spawn or aren't visible in the boat. And because this is a more advanced actor that we want to have more control over, it has its own buoyancy data set up here. In terms of float, the only extra step is that our boat model really shouldn't have, um, or rather have a very low set of mass. It should have simulate physics on. In terms of collision channels, it should be world dynamic because that will interact now with waterline out of the box. To block everything, you can. these are really optional the way you want them. The important thing is that it should overlap with waterline. And in terms of, let's see, tag it doesn't have tag and it doesn't need to generate overlap events the floats however need to have um, simulate physics disabled they can have a higher mass setting and if you want you could adjust the linear and angular dampening on these four actors in fact you can select them all four and change these uh, for all of them in terms of object type they should be world dynamic again and they should overlap with world static and waterline type actors. In terms of tags, it's very important that they use a slightly more special float three tag. And we're gonna go over a moment why this is important. We, we might actually cover this in the, our next uh, video. So what does this look like? Well, first of all, you may have no noticed that this is named boat template. And now we have a couple of generalized templates for boat large ship, medium ship, small ship, and a yacht. And we also have a vessel preset map. You could use these. 
as you want. You can add an additional uh, static mesh component, weld it to the boat. Make sure it's not having really ma any mass or simulating physics, and you can hide this one if you want. And yeah, you can base it, or if you want, you could just replace the static mesh used here with one of your own and just have your own ship ready to go. One final thing we recommend doing is selecting the overall template, going to tags, and making sure that you have the tag boat for this specific type of actor. And uh, yeah, once this is all set up, you will have some more advanced sort of interactions that we're going to go over in our next uh, tutorial. Not save this at the moment. We have a separate vessel preset map. And if we were to go into world settings and just go into game mode base, simulate, you could see that we have now a much better simulation where smaller things like our boat are being actually moved around and dragged around by the waves. The waves are quite big, so there is some clipping through the boat itself. You have the slightly larger yacht preset, which is fairly static, a smaller ship, and a larger ship, and a really big ship that are pretty much uh, stationary. Now the big ship is sinking at the moment because in this map, whoops, let's just simulate a little bit of ocean to clear this up. Is because it was outside of our buoyancy range. So let's just uh, increase that to 10,000. And it's now better. Now our large ship preset was not really done so by accident. This is sort of set to simulate a ship that is 400 meters and uh, well basically the largest ship in existence. And there's still some motion from the waves uh, but it's very slight. Of course you could tweak these to your liking, how much uh, it's getting picked up, how much is moved around. And all of this is done through the different uh, settings that we have for linear dampening. For example, here we have it uh, set mass to 300, but what we've done is adjusted a lot of the um, maximum force, drag coefficient. Uh, this coefficient value here has a big sort of impact on how bouncy something would appear on the water. For example, this large ship has a value of 0 0.75, whereas our boat has a value of 2.5. And this is what really allows it to be picked up by the waves and dragged. Also, ocean drag is set to three, so it moves along with the waves. Whereas the big guy here has ocean drag set to one. So it does still pick up a little bit of movement, but not a lot. And that combined with its physical settings for mass and dampening, um, kind of m mitigate this even further.